race to win laws and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions Jeep, a family off-roader with an illustrious World War II past. Duct Tape How a mother's wartime concerns created the ultimate utility tape. Pilot Jacket Designed for the wartime flyers of yesteryear, yet at home on our city streets today. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these Wicked Inventions. There aren't many things as exhilarating and exciting as off-road driving through mud, rough terrain and even water. And when it comes to off-road vehicles, the Jeep is an icon of its class, closely associated with freedom and adventure. Today, there are many models and variations of Jeep, but the Jeep car brand can trace its roots right back to World War II. The Jeep was born to be put to task in war and played a key part in the Allies' defence against Nazi Germany. As the reality that the United States would soon be joining the fight in Europe hit home, the US Army requested that vehicle manufacturers provided working prototypes for a four-wheel drive reconnaissance car that could survive the rigors of warfare. It was the car company American Bantam that rose to the challenge with Detroit-born freelance designer Carl Probes producing blueprints for the vehicle in just two days, and he and his team had the hand-built prototype built in less than two months. The prototype was named the Bantam Reconnaissance Car, and with this, the long history of the Jeep had begun. To produce the huge number of these new vehicles that were required for the US war effort, the Army also recruited car companies Willis and Ford. They were asked to produce similar vehicles based on the prototype. This resulted in three new reconnaissance cars ready for battle. Each company produced their own version of the Willis design. 1,500 of each model were built and tested extensively before being sent off to every service of the US military. These sturdy, reliable vehicles were put to use for all manner of purposes, from cable laying, firefighting, field ambulances, and some were even adapted to run on railway tracks. Nearly 30% of all Jeeps were also supplied to Great Britain and the Soviet Red Army, making them a very familiar sight across Europe during World War II. For the first time, you could have a vehicle with, you know, with not just powering the rear uh, axle, also powering the front, so it could go over. You know, as all four tyres, four wheels were were actually in use at each time, could go over much more robust, rougher terrain to get the the individuals around the battlefield more quickly. Today, the rugged little Jeep has evolved into sophisticated off-road models, such as the Patriot, which is made at FCA US's Belvedere Assembly Plant in Illinois, USA. The production of a Jeep begins with the stamping of a sheet of steel into all of the relevant body parts, such as the roof, the bonnets and doors. These newly formed parts then move to the body shop. This is where each of these separate segments are brought together and welded into place. This starts with welding together the floor of the vehicle. The main component of the floor panel has a lot of structural steel welded onto it and is placed onto the underbody of the car. Once this is done, the side aperture assembly begins. The side apertures are the big side panels that fix onto the side of the car that have the door openings cut out of them. Once this structure has been built in what is known as the framer, the roof of the vehicle is added. Our Jeep is now beginning to take shape. Next up, it's time to construct and add the closure panels. Closure panels for us are the doors, the hoods, the lift gate, things like the fenders, things like that. The welding is all done uh, almost 100% by robots, so there's, um, I'm going to say, about over 4,000 welds per vehicle. In the Patriot Body Shop, there's uh, about 800 robots that, uh, that are used in order to build a Patriot. Some of the closure panels that we put on, the lift gates and things like that, are done by robots as well. And that's all done for precision and for quality, so that uh, take any of the human variation out of it. These closure panels, such as the hood or bonnet of the car, have the doors come in two separate panels, the inner and outer. 
the inner panel is a reinforced structure that gives the Jeep its sturdiness. These two panels are welded together by the many robots and also go through a hemming process that seals them before being added. From the body shop, the vehicle transfers to the paint shop. Here it undergoes four separate painting processes that prepare the metal to accept paint, whilst also protecting it from road chips, rust and prevent leakages in the joints. The vehicle is then finished with colour before being painted with a clear paint that gives the Jeep its shine. To get through the paint shop is about 14 to 16 hours. Um, it's uh, of, the, of the major areas in the assembly plant, it takes the longest to get through the paint shop. Uh, you got to appreciate the fact that you're applying a layer of paint and then you've got to put it through an oven to dry so there's, so there's some time allowed as it goes through all these various ovens to dry. Foam is then added to the body of the vehicle. What we don't want the customer to experience is uh, some road noise coming up through the pillars of the vehicle so we put some sound deadening uh, foam material in the, in the cavities of the vehicle. The Jeep is then moved onto the trim line. Here the doors are removed to give more easy access to the workers. All the internal wiring and trim of the doors are then added. We can't forget the addition of the all-important and world-famous Jeep logo. This is fitted with expert precision by the workers, with the help of their trusty aligning tools that guide the badges into place. The vehicle moves down the line to have the roof trim fitted, containing all the relevant wires, fixtures and fittings. It is at this point that the specially designed and aptly named Happy Seat is used by the workers. Well, it was a little bit before my time, but how did the name Happy Seat come up? Uh, once we installed it, operators were a lot happier. <laughs> this seat allows the worker to effortlessly maneuver around the vehicle in an ergonomically advantageous position to best work on the roof trim. The dashboard unit is then fitted. Next is the assembly of the rolling chassis of the Jeep that contains everything that will make it drive, the engine, transmission and suspension for example. Once this has been fitted to the vehicle and all the glass and windows have been added, it is moved on to be finished and tested. Seats go in, carpeting goes in, um, the steering wheel goes in, some of the, the front and rear bumpers go in, things like that. And then the very, very last uh, part of the assembly is uh, we do a myriad of checks. So we'll, We'll hook up computers to the vehicle and do, do all the electrical checks. Uh, we'll make sure that everything's functional. Um, and then from there we take it and we actually uh, put the vehicle on uh, some metal rollers and we're able to take that vehicle up to uh, 60, 70 miles per hour, check the, that everything's functioning, the brakes work, the cruise control work, things like that. Once the Jeep has passed all the tests, it is cleaned, polished and sent out to the customer, ready for another adventure. The Jeep, truly a wicked invention. It is that indispensable roll of tape that no discerning business or home can be without. Used for fixing everything from damaged racing cars to unruly wires, duct tape has become as useful to us as the screwdriver or hammer. But did you know that this household essential can actually trace its creation to World War II? Although strips of cotton duct tape have been used for reinforcing shoes and wrapping electrical cables since the turn of the 1900s, and the invention of adhesive tapes was not far behind, the demands of World War II saw these two products unite into one of the most useful products ever made. Well, duct tape originated in, uh, again in the Second World War uh, through a requirement to seal ammunition boxes to keep them free of water. So duct tape sort of came about. It was designed around some, some existing tapes which people had at the time, but duct tape was different because it was waterproof, incredibly strong, but also you could rip it quite easily, so you could tear it quite easily. So, did the idea for duct tape originate from some clever planner in the US military? Well, not quite. Vesta Stalt, a concerned mother of two young naval recruits, came up with the idea whilst working in an ammunition ordnance factory. Concerned that the current, thin, waxed paper tape that was supposed to provide a waterproof seal used at the time was inadequate and could be troublesome to open under fire, she came up with the idea to use a waterproof cloth, reinforced tape instead. 
Vesta reasoned that this design flaw meant her son's lives were on the line. And after her superiors were deaf to her concerns, a quick note to the current US President Franklin D. Roosevelt soon put developing her idea into the hands of the chemistry boffins at Johnson & Johnson, who would create the new tape. Named Duck Tape after its waterproof ability and the duck cotton on which it was based, this tape became an instant hit with the military. It was easy to apply and remove, came in a variety of colours including the standard US olive drab and was soon put to work repairing vehicles and keeping investors importing ammunition boxes dry. And because it was so useful and its adhesive qualities were so good and once it was stuck on something you knew it would last, it was therefore used for a whole variety of other uh, means, whether it was sticking up things to, to deck heads or, or to walls, to repairing, doing a local repair or a small repair. Some repairs which ended up, it was so effective that they remained in place, so and, uh, some duct tape would stay on a wall for, for years. Duct tape has evolved into a variety of tapes for different applications, including a heat-resistant duct tape, made for sealing heating and ventilation units and pipe work. This has led to the name duct, or duck, tape being used as an informal title that encapsulates all cloth or scrim-backed plastic tapes. But how is the tape made? Basically, duct tape is made of three main components, the adhesive, the cloth, and the film. The adhesive starts with natural rubber. It comes out of rubber trees, much like maple syrup comes out of maple trees. They send it to us in these big bulk bales, and then we begin the processing. The second component is the cloth, much like a medical gauze that you'd see in your house. That's what gives duct tape its strength. The third component then of duct tape is the waterproof backing, much like a poly tarp that you find around your house. It's made out of a base plastic. You can add various color concentrates that give you your base color. This one would give you your natural silver. But you can add other color concentrates that would get you the blue or a yellow, and you can even print the film to get these nice patterns. The production of duct tape begins with creating the adhesive by mixing the gooey rubber with a sticky resin until it is about the consistency of a pizza dough. It is then fed into a machine where it is heated and mixed further. With the adhesive ready for application, the production of the rolls can begin. We're going to take the cloth scrim here and the polyfilm here. We're going to unwind them together, send it into the countering unit. At that point, the adhesive is applied, goes through the cloth, to the film, forming that nice tight bond. Now you got duct tape. The tape is initially produced as one large roll. The rolls are then resized for the consumer. The rolls are sliced into strips and re-rolled. This is our converting operation. Now we're going to take that big roll of duct tape we saw earlier, and we're going to cut it down into rolls that you're used to seeing in the store. There's a lot of these slitter knives in there. They're turning at a high rate of speed, cutting the tape as it goes through the machine, and it winds up here. From there, it goes into our packaging unit. We're now at our packaging unit. This one, we're going to make a, a nice, pretty package for you to see in the store. The roll of tape comes onto our packaging unit, sleeve goes on top, goes into the oven, and you end up with a nice retail package. The tape is packaged and ready to be used by households across the globe. I and mean, clearly, with so many great uses in the military, it's obvious that it would be have fantastic use uh, commercially and in many people's houses. Uh, and plumbers or ver various other craftsmen will use it all the time when they're going around. It's particularly useful like that. And so most houses have got at least a couple of um, bits of duct tape in their garage. Duct tape is a worldwide success, but its popularity isn't just constrained to the Earth. Since the Gemini space program of the early 1960s, NASA have included rolls of duct tape on every subsequent space flight. It has been used to repair the lunar rover, notably help save the lives of the crew of Apollo 13, when it was used to modify carbon dioxide filters that were essential to their life support system. And the space connection doesn't just end there. Duct tape is so popular that it has been estimated that the amount sold every year would stretch to the moon, or wrap around the Earth's equator over 12 times. Whether you call it duct or duct tape, Fester Stout's creation is truly a wicked invention. It is supposed to be sticky and strong, but how much? Well, let's find out with a couple of, not very, scientific experiments. Experiment 1. Load strength. How much strength does the cotton weave of the tape give? We are going to take a forklift truck and see if the duct tape can suspend our tester, who weighs in at a trim 86 kilograms. Right from the start, our tester identifies a problem. The inside of the forks are quite sharp, which might cut the tape under load. To combat this, he comes up with an ingenious idea of wrapping padding around the forks to give the tape a blunt edge to stick to. 
carefully, our two experimenters wrap the tape around the forks. A single length of tape is pulled across the forks and then wrapped underneath and back across. This is then repeated to provide two supports of tape with a thickness of four layers of tape. Now, can it take our tester's weight? With anticipation building, he makes a gallant attempt. And success! The lengths of tape can support the weight of our tester, proving that duct tape really has got some super tensile strength. Experiment 2. Adhesive properties. Also known as, how sticky is it? Known to be able to keep repairs in place for sometimes years, how effective is the tape to stick in objects to surfaces? The test. Our intrepid tester will lie down whilst his faithful assistant attempts to stick him to the floor, with nothing more than the adhesive strength of the mighty tape. Once wrapped in a silvery cocoon, can our man break free of his bonds? Well, let's find out. Our intrepid tester is now completely stuck to the floor, but will it hold? Well, yes. So it seems the tape has passed the adhesive tape test with flying colours. So, strong and sticky, duct tape really is a wicked invention. Anyone? Um. Oh. The Pilot Jacket. A timeless classic, synonymous with fighter pilots and Hollywood films. This versatile jacket seems to have been around forever and has always been cool. But where did it all start? During the early 1900s, air travel was getting more and more advanced. But, as with most technologies, their advancement grew rapidly because of one thing, war. The reason you need these substantial flying jackets, you've got to go back to the First World War, when they weren't just a flying jacket. You had, first of all, your uniform that crossed over, so the fasting wasn't there, so the wind couldn't get in. And then you had your leather sheepskin trousers, and then the great big three-quarter length sheepskin coat. The first pilot jackets were insulated with shearling or fur fabrics, but in the 1920s and 30s, Leslie Irvin, who was the first producer of pilot jackets in the UK and who supplied most of the RAF during the Second World War, introduced a sheepskin collar to his designs. This was because it was more cost-effective than fur and also contained insulating and waterproofing properties due to the lanolin in the sheep's wool. With a sudden rise in aeronautical technology, planes could fly for longer and at greater altitudes. But at these heights, pilots could freeze to death due to the drop in temperature. At the time of World War II, bombers could now reach 30,000 feet with temperatures well below minus 40. And Irving's pilot jacket had become a standard issue amongst the RAF and among many with the American Air Force. It had not only grown in reputation for its warmth, comfort and practicality, but it had also developed as quite the status symbol among young pilots. If you imagine what it would be like to be in a Second World War bomber, high up in the air, there is no heating. And in the American bombers, the side windows were actually open, absolutely freezing. You had to have your full kit insulated. If not, you would simply freeze to death. It is still used by air forces today, however, not in a cockpit. Its status as a fashion garment has grown due to its uses in many Hollywood films, where it is often worn by the hero. But its unique and practical design has seen it adopted, not just by the Air Force. The popularity and versatility of the pilot's jacket has led to its adoption not only by the Air Force, but by other services within the American Army, and also by several police forces, mainly in the United States. Pilots are seen as daring and brave, and wearing a pilot jacket could be seen to convey those qualities upon its wearer. British-based company Oxford Blue offer a new, innovative design based on this timeless classic. Oxford Blue was started in the early 60s by my grandfather, and uh, I'm the third generation in the family business. Over the 40-plus years that we've been going for, the company has changed from being a manufacturer to a manufacturing base as well as a, a brand label and making for other companies as well. The 
the process starts with pre-designed patterns for the pilot jacket. These are laid out and arranged so that all the materials used for the jacket can be cut to these patterns before reaching the workshop. Once the materials have been cut, they reach the workshop where workers can start to meticulously stitch the garment together. Work begins on the main inner labels of the jacket being stitched into place first. Production then begins on the pockets, where all the various components such as the lining, strips and pocket bags have already been cut to size and shape. The pocket bags are sewn to the strips, the strips to the lining, and then the lining to the main outer garment. From there it is over to a machine that is finishing the sleeves and elbow patches of the jacket. The elbow patches are sewn with two seams and then sewn into the sleeve. The D-string buckles are made from two small strips of material sewn together. They are then folded through a metal ring and sewn again onto a larger strip of material. These will be added to the jacket later. The pilot jacket is now starting to take shape as the zips are ready to be added. First, strips of the outer material are attached to the garment. Then the zips are sewed in and integrated with the jacket on both sides. Once the outer parts such as pockets and zips are completed, the garment is hemmed at the bottom to seal it and the inner lining is finely stitched and integrated with the main outer material. Two of the D-string buckles we saw earlier are stitched onto a strip of wax cotton and a special cross stitch is made using a Sunstar machine. This part is then added to the final piece of the garment, the woolen collar. Sherpa wool is cut into the strips using a KM machine. The blade is so sharp it can cut through almost anything, so only a very skilled operator can use it whilst wearing a Kevlar glove. Once the collar is attached to the jacket, everything is almost finished. The challenges we face making a, a good durable pilot jacket would, would include uh, having good components, the fabrics being of good quality, because our pilot jacket is shower proof. Uh, basically the, the, the fabric is wax cotton, which is locally sourced. Uh, the lining is quilted with a polyester filler. Uh, with a cotton inner, um, that makes it warm. And then we've got the Sherpa synthetic collar that we use for the, for the garment. The inner lining is married to the outer. The zips, pockets and collar have been stitched into place. Now it's over to quality control where the jacket gets a full inspection. The outside of the garment is checked for tear and loose stitching. The pockets are also checked for holes and the arms and zips are checked for any imperfections. Once cleared, one side of the press studs are added using an AB part machine. Then the second side of studs are added using a CD machine, now completing the garment. The finished pilot jacket is given another quality check before the various labels and tags are added. It is then folded, bagged and packed, ready for delivery. The pilot jacket, truly a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realised their amazing background. Jeep, duct tape and the pilot jacket, all wicked inventions.